I say to you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing out its fruits. And as some of the Pharisees asked him, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said to them, the kingdom of God will not come with observation. And they will not say, behold, here it is, or behold, it is there. For lo, the kingdom of God is within you. Matthew 21, 43, Luke 17, 20 to 21. Cherished listeners, welcome to the Oracles of God Radio Broadcast, a biblical program that is run and sponsored by the Churches of Christ, which come your way every Wednesday, 5 30 a.m. on Radio Universe 105.7 FM. Shall we go to God in prayer? Our great God and most benevolent Father, to you do we ascribe praise, glory, and honor. We bow down in awe of your greatness. It is by you that everything, though seen and not seen, exists. We thank you, O God, for this beautiful day you've added to our lives. Thank you for making us Africans in your own wisdom. Thank you for this African Union Day. Let this day help us to unite them more in your name and seek your unity in your church as well. We humbly ask you, loving Father, to forgive us of all sins we've committed against you in all forms, either unknowingly or by design. We pray, committing today's program unto you, okay, once again, grant us good utterance and receptive hearts as speakers and listeners, respectively. May your grace be on all our listeners, O oh God, so that they may understand and act in accordance with your oracles. We do commit the entire staff of Radio Universe into mighty hands, especially technicians, O oh Lord, that they may be able to transmit these, your words, and not be treated to your audience. Begin and end successfully with us, in the name above all names, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Cherished listeners, we continue with a series of lessons we draw from the theme, Eschatology. We are still on the exposition of selected misconstrued texts of the 144,000 people mentioned, Revelation 7 and 14. And the text we are discussing is Luke 12, 32 which reads as follows, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We are on the second part of the text with the topic, Kingdom. Last week, before we started the discussion on the kingdom of God that existed, where the father was king and head over everything before the ascension of Jesus Christ, we helped ourselves with a brief study about the definition of Godhead, and the following notes were made that there is a relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that is not possible to fully communicate with human words. This is because when man understands totally everything about God, then God will cease to be God. For what makes God is that aspect that belongs to him alone. We were therefore not to assume anything on our own apart from the letter that God has revealed 
about himself in the Bible. We also learned that it is an assumption on the part of men to think that passages like 1 Corinthians 11.3, in which it is stated that the head of Christ is God, the God mentioned in the context refers to the Father only. This is because throughout the Old Testament, we understand that the word God will refer to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For instance, let us make man in our image. We also learned that biblical interpreters in the New Testament also get confused the more because they assume that there must of necessity be a division in the Godhead because of the specific manifestation of God through the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. However, this view must be challenged when it comes to some texts as the one quoted in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3 where the head of Christ will be God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This would indicate that neither manifestation of God functions in his work separate or apart from the others. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work as one, and thus God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the head of Christ, who was the incarnate manifestation of God. Cherished listeners, we learned interestingly also that while in his incarnate state, the Son had a positional relationship with the Father in order to receive all things and authority from the Father. The Father's relationship with the Son, therefore, has something to do with headship and authority to be given to the Son. The Son received and then would return authority to the Father at or after the final coming, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 28. This may indicate that there was permanency in the Son's incarnation. In other words, the Son shall remain forever in eternity with his brethren in the form of his resurrected body. Cherishedness, we finally studied in this part that regardless of what happens in deity's relationship with all creature things, whether the Father will rule, whether the Son will rule, the relationship of deity in the Godhead stays the same. Though the divine headship and kingship in relation to deity's reign over creation changes, the relationship of deity within the Godhead never changes. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is God. And that is what the Bible says, God is all in all. Cherished listeners, after the definition of the Godhead last week, we moved on to discuss the first of the five kingdoms of God mentioned in the Bible. And that is the kingdom in which the Father was king before the ascension. Many passages such as the following were quoted to authenticate this fact, some of which include Psalm 10 verse 16, Psalm 24 verse 10, Psalm 44 verse 4, Isaiah 33, 22, Psalm 22 verse 27 and 28. We ended last week by saying, that though God was the sovereign king of all things, there, still, there were still disobedient subjects at the right in every kingdom reign. Disobedience does not negate the sovereignty of God. Thus, God's sovereign reign is not limited by the rebellion of any or many subjects. Cherishedness, today we shall move on to the second of the five kingdoms we will want to conclude in the first one. And before we start the second one, it will be very important if we conclude entirely the first one of the Father. And if we want to buttress the fact that when God was king over all, and he had a relationship with the kingdom of Israel, his kingdom never reduced. When he became the king of Israel, the kingship over all nations never reduced. The Father was king of all nations before the ascension and we mean all nations it must be emphasized that before the ascension of the son the father was not only the king of Israel he was also the king of all things that existed his sovereignty included things on the earth and things in heaven first chronicles chapter 29 verse 11 and 12 first chronicles 29 11 and 12 is a key passage to remember on this point. David stood before Israel and made the following statement 
that states the sovereignty of the Father beyond the Israelite kingdom. And I quote, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom. O Lord, and you are exalted as head of all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Unquote. At the time the above passage was written, the Father had universal sovereignty over all things. The Father, at the time David made this statement, was head and king of things, both in heaven, that is spirit world, and in the earth, the physical world. The passage is saying that the Father reigned over all before the cross and ascension of Jesus Christ. The psalmist wrote, and I quote, in Psalm 103, verse 19, Psalm 103, verse 19, and I quote, The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom, sovereignty, rules over all. Unquote. Notice, cherished listeners, also, in First Chronicles 29, 11, 12, we've read, that a father was head over all. In other words, he had control over all that was created. It will be important to remember this when we discuss the headship of Jesus, as it is explained in the New Testament. Jesus, after his ascension, was made head over all things for the sake of the church. Concerning the nature of the Father's kingship before the ascension, Jeremiah added his voice. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10, Jeremiah 10, 10, and I quote, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth will tremble, and the nations will not be able to abide his indignation. Jeremiah 10, 10, unquote. The nature of these statements manifests the universal reign of the Father of all things before the ascension of Jesus. This headship and kingship extended beyond the nation of Israel. Passages as Isaiah chapter 10 verse 5 and 6 illustrate the work of the sovereignty of the Father among the nations in the Old Testament. For Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 10 5 and 6 and I quote, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Unquote. The emphasis of this passage is that all nations were under the control of the Father before the ascension. They were under his control in order to lead the world to the revelation of the seed of woman who would bring redemption to the world. The Father controlled the beginning and ending of nations in order to accomplish his eternal plan. He used the nations to bring judgment against the nation of Israel in order to preserve a remnant for the revelation of the incarnation redeemer. Galatians chapter 4 verse 4. The father therefore was a king who reigned over universal sovereignty before the ascension. Some have wrongly assumed that the father forgot the rest of the nations of the world when he established a covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai. This conclusion is often assumed from the fact that a great portion of the Old Testament is directed toward the history of the nation of Israel. However, such a conclusion is unwarranted. The Father continued to work among the nations through priests, such as Jethro. At times, he even sent Israelite prophets to Gentile nations as Nineveh. Nineveh repented not only because of the message of Jonah, but also because there were evidently other preachers of righteousness in Nineveh who had provoked Nineveh to repentance and paved the way for Jonah. All Jonah did was preach the conclusion to their sermons by pronouncing the judgment. God worked among the nations, though Israel was chosen as a nation through whom the Messiah would come. Therefore, we must not assume that God terminated his kinship relationship with other nations when he chose Israel for the nations of the world in order to preserve a segment of society from which to bring the seed of a woman into the world. 
never assume that whenever God has a special relationship with a group of people or a nation, then Satan has the rest. To say that, the world belongs to Satan. It is not true. The statement of Peter concerning the feeling of God toward all humanity is that the Lord is not willing that any should perish. Unquote. It's God's attitude at all times in the history of men. Deity has always worked to save man. Israel was chosen to preserve a portion of humanity through which to bring the Savior into the world. However, the Lord's plea that all should repent has stood firm since Adam's sin. It will remain until the call of the last great tr trump. It is important to understand, cherished listeners, that the Father is pictured as both king and head of all things in the Old Testament. His reign was beyond the nation of Israel. Though he had a kingly relationship with Israel, we must not assume that his kingship of all things ceased when Israel became a nation. We must not assume that his headship over all creation terminated when he began headship control over Israel. This is very important when we come to the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. So we need to have this prelude to understand the kingship relationship of God and humankind. The Father was a universal king and head of all things before the existence of the nation of Israel. He continued this sovereignty until the ascension of Jesus Christ. And with that, we move on quickly to the second kingdom mentioned in the Bible, and that is the sovereignty of the Father over Israel. Sovereignty of the Father over Israel. We have looked at the sovereignty of the Father over all nations, irrespective of his relationship with Israel. We are typically now moving on to the second kingdom, sovereignty of the Father over Israel as a kingdom. We often form a mental perception of the kingship and headship of the Father over Israel that is limited. We say that this headship and kingship is limited because in our studies of the Old Testament, we often lead ourselves to believe that God discontinued his work among the Gentiles when he established a covenant relationship with Israel on Mount Sinai. This is an easy mistake to make because the greater part of the Old Testament was written primarily to the Jewish nation in order to preserve them for the coming revelation of the seed of woman who will redeem the world. However, we must not lead ourselves to believe that God was not working among the Gentiles through the period of history that is recorded in the Old Testament. God the Father was the king of Assyria and Babylon as he was the king of Israel. Though he did not have a covenant relationship with any other nation than Israel. He was also the head over Moab, Egypt, Assyria, and other Gentile nations as he was the head of Israel. The kingdom of Israel was a nation of people set apart from the nations of the world in order to accomplish the eternal plan of God to redeem those of the world who will come to him through faith. God had made a promise to Abraham to make of him a great nation according to Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 to 3. God also made a promise that of his seed all nations of the earth would be blessed. The blessing was a reference to the Christ according to Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. For this reason God worked to preserve the nation of Israel until the coming of the Christ. Because of this the nation of Israel enjoyed a unique kingdom relationship with the Father, because the Father had previously made a promise to Abraham and established a covenant with him. God subsequently made a covenant with Israel because of his promise and covenant with Abraham. Nevertheless, cherished listeners, the kingdom relationship between God and Israel was only a small portion of the Father's relationship with all nations of the world. Though the Father did not establish a covenant relationship with other nations as he did with Israel. Israel was chosen for a specific purpose. This purpose was to preserve a portion of society until the promise of the seed would be fulfilled. Once the promise of the seed was fulfilled, then there will be no more need for the nation of Israel. 
In looking at the kingdom of the national Israel, cherishedness, the Israelites were separated from the world in their special kingdom relationship with the Father. They were a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. This is a significant statement and one that lays the groundwork for understanding the future similar relationship the church will have with Jesus Christ after Acts chapter 2. God said to Israel, and I quote, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all nations. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Yes, God was the king of all nations. However, to the Israelites, he told them that they shall be to him a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. What a kingdom within the universal kingdom of God. When the Father established this unique sovereign relationship with Israel, this did not mean that he seems to be a king over all other nations. Neither did this actually terminate the sovereignty of the Father over all nations. The Father was still a king, and his universal sovereignty over all creation continued. God's promise to Israel that there will be a special treasure does exemplify the special relationship the nation of Israel was to enjoy with the Father. Because of the covenant relationship with God, the house of Israel will be a kingdom of priests. Israel would be a holy nation. There will be a kingdom of subjects within the universal kingdom of the Father. All the Israelite nation was the kingdom of God. But not all the kingdom of God was the Israelite nation. Note this carefully as we will jump onto that of the relationship between Jesus and the church and the whole world. The Father will be their head, but he will also be the head of all nations. He will be their king, but he will also be the king of all nations. Because of Israel's covenant relationship, the nation was a special treasure to the Father. Nevertheless, his headship and kingship over all things went beyond the physical nation of Israel. Cherish listeners, you, we want to understand this. We want to appreciate the breadth and the length of the kingship of God the Father before the ascension of Christ. Because it is this same length and breadth of the kingdomship that he gave to the Son. When God was handing over the kingship to the Son, he never reduced it. And that is why we need to understand the extent to which Jesus currently is reigning. Whether he's reigning only over the church, obedient subjects, or he's king of kings over all nations. And so this serves as a prelims to that study. Let us look at something small still about the kingship of God over the nation of Israel. Some were thinking God rejected the nation of Israel. Some were thinking the nation of Israel rejected God, and so Jesus should come back and sit on the physical throne of God or David, when even the time the throne of David is used for Jesus. Some are so expecting Jesus, therefore, to come and sit on the throne of David physically in Jerusalem and rule for a period of thousand years. That is unfortunate. So let us look at how the time the throne of David is even used in the totality of the kingdom of God when the Israelites were saying, give us a king. It was the Father's original intention that Israel be ruled directly from heaven through the judges and prophets. It is true. He entrusted the spiritual care of Israel to the priests and elders. However, he knew that Israel would eventually clamor to have an earthly king and the nations around them. Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 22. Nevertheless, when Israel was granted an earthly king, that king was only an earthly symbol of heavenly authority. I repeat, when Israel was granted an earthly king, that king was only an earthly symbol of heavenly authority. Therefore, cherished listeners, whenever you come to the term throne of David, 
Don't look at the physical wood throne of David in Jerusalem. It is the throne of God. When the throne of David is ascribed to Jesus that he will sit on it, it is referring to him sitting on the throne of God in heaven. It has nothing to do with physical throne made of wood in Jerusalem. It is a term used in the Bible because God used the kings as symbols of heavenly authority. Therefore, the term throne of David was a term which had reference to the Father reigning from heaven through an earthly king over Israel. Israel's rejection of God's original system of rule directly from heaven through judges and prophets did not change his kingship over the kingdom of Israel. This is clearly seen when Solomon succeeded David as king of Israel. David said that the father, and I quote, David said that the father, and I quote, has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel, unquote. First Chronicles chapter 28 verse 5. In First Chronicles 28 5, David referred to the throne Solomon was going to sit on as the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. First Chronicles 28 5. When Solomon assumed his position as king, it was stated again in First Chronicles 29 23. First Chronicles 29 23, and I quote, Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David his father. I repeat, First Chronicles 29 23, and I quote, Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David his father. So the throne of David and the throne of God are interchangeably used in the Bible because God was ruling the nation of Israel through the kings as symbols of authority. The throne on which both David and Solomon sat was the throne of the kingdom of the Lord. The kingdom was the father's. The throne was the father's. David's throne in Jerusalem was only a symbol of heavenly authority on earth. Cherish listeners. This is very interesting. It is telling us that indeed God never relegated his kingship to any individual, other human being, or Satan, or whoever. He is so firmly in control. So even though when the Israelites rejected that system of kingship directly from him, through priests and elders and judges, God still ruled through his chosen kings. That is why if the king did not obey him, he removed him and wrote about him. If a king obeyed him, he was blessed as David. And so there is nothing for us to get confused regarding the throne of David and the throne of God. The fact that the Israelites rejected God's system of rulership did not mean that God also reduced his kingship and allowed men to rule. God the Father ruled from heaven using the kings as symbols of authority. If the Bible is talking about Jesus will sit on his father's throne of David therefore, oh do not be mistaken to think that he's talking about a physical throne that Jesus will come and sit in Jerusalem. What interesting it would have been. What an irony. Uh, and and, and what is the meaning of that? Jesus having all authority in heaven will leave all nations and be interested in the small city of Jerusalem to sit on a physical throne. What will it be? Rather, it is referring to the throne of God. And the Bible has mentioned it here. David referred to the throne of his throne he was sitting on as the throne of God. And therefore, when his son was about to sit on it, he referred to it as the throne of God. And so it is used scripturally that Jesus will sit on the throne of his father, David. So never made a mistake to literalize everything. We like literalized things that are idiomatic 
and spiritual. And we like uh, proverbial things that are literal. It's unfortunate. Let us be humble and go straight to the Bible and apply the scriptures as it has been given to us. Our purpose of studying this is to uphold, respect, and worship the Jesus that God has ordained as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Our purpose is to uphold the sovereignty of Godhead throughout eternity. The devil had never had any grips of the kingdom of God. Irrespective of the disobedience of people through the deception of the devil, God is king and he rules on all the nations. That is a fact that we need to draw. So when we come to that of his son, Jesus Christ, we will understand the extent to which he is ruling. If we think that death should be no more, if we think that disobedience of death should be no more, before you understand that the kingdom Jesus was talking about is here with us and is ruling, then you are mistaken. Then you are literalizing everything about the kingdom. That is why we are taking our time to go through step by step. That if you are expecting Jesus to come in some thousand years to in Jerusalem, it will be so funny and interesting to Jesus himself. Because he is currently sitting on the throne of David. The term throne of David is the throne of God, as it has been quoted. And not anywhere in the Bible that the term throne of David is used, that is the meaning. It is the throne of God, where God ruled through the chosen kings as emblem of his authority. So currently, we shall come to that when we shall see Jesus exalted on high, sitting on the throne of David. He is already sitting on that throne of David. And that throne of David is the throne of God. As has been read to our hearing this morning. Cherish listeners. It is very interesting to delve into such topics because there are a lot of confusion in the kingdom. A lot of people are confusing themselves. They can't distinguish one kingdom from the other. They can't understand even the universal kingship of God some even don't know the difference between Ecclesia, Ecclesia and Basilia. They can't interpret, they fight over it. But this is simple something that we need to understand. That the fact that God had a nation peculiar to himself as the Israelite kingdom never negated his authority, Basilia, sovereign rule over all nations. And when we come to that of the church, you will see how wonderful we wish to be part of the church. Because we have that unique relationship also with Jesus, even though he is king over all nations as it is. Remember, when God referred to the nation of Israel, he said there will be to him a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so it is wonderful to be part of that kingdom. It's wonderful to be part to have that unique relationship, even though he continues to be king over all nations. This morning, this is what we've learned. We've understood that, in fact, God has been in firm control over all, so far as Basilia, sovereign rule, kingdom, is concerned. He has ruled all nations, and he also had a peculiar relationship with the second kingdom. We talk about a kingdom within a kingdom. That is with the nation of Israel. We've learned that when God had that relationship, and even it came to a time that the Israelites did not like the style of God's rulership, God was not surprised because he had already predicted that it would happen that way. So he continued to be their king. He used the kings as symbols of authority on this earth. Therefore, the term throne of David is not a physical wooden structure throne of David. It stands for the throne of God. Whatever it is used in the Bible, it means the throne of God. If Jesus will sit on his father's throne, we shall come back to it sometime later. God willing, you will understand that he is currently sitting on the throne of David. The thousand year reign we study some other time. We are in that era. That era of Christ's resurrection till he comes again is proverbialized as thousand year reign. 
And that is when he is sitting on his father's throne. Don't be disappointed. If you don't yield to this Christ, if you don't bow down to the king God has ordained, then you are not respecting the totality of the Godhead. Remember, deity rules. And they've never allowed anybody to disrespect them in any form. God is one. Deity is one. And his manifestation through the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit should be respected. All knees should therefore bow down to him, to our own salvation, and to the glory of the Father. Oh, may God continue to bless us. May he continue to open our understanding and give us wisdom in his ways. Once again, this has been the Oracles of God radio broadcast, a biblical program that is run and sponsored by the Churches of Christ, which come your way every Wednesday. 5.30 a.m., make a day with us, same time God willing next week, and God continues to unravel his missus through his words, and we wish that you be part and enjoy the blessings of God. We wish you well in wherever you are. Have a wonderful, happy African Union Day. But this union, let us translate it to the union of God's people. Because when we are united as God's people, then we shall be successful. Long live God's kingdom. Long live the African continent. Long live Christians all over the world. Long live the unity and the fight for the oneness in his church. So that when he comes, we shall all sing hallelujah and bring many a people from the kingdoms of the devil to the kingdom of his dear son. May God bless us and good morning. Stay blessed till we meet again. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.